On behalf of Alice and Sesh, I welcome Professor Sharid Bhomik from Center for Labor Studies, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai, India. Uh, tomorrow we have a seminar on confronting the marginalization of urban informal workers. And to begin with, I would first like to ask Professor Bhomik as to what is his general field of interest precisely at the moment? Well, uh, thank you, Dhruv. And first, before I give my answer, I'd like to thank Alice and all its members for having invited me over. Uh, well, at present, you know, for the last decade or so, I have been working on the urban informal employment. Now, that is something which has fascinated me because earlier when I started my work, as a researcher several decades ago, I was interested in the formal sector and uh, because I felt that was the more dynamic sector, it was unionized and it could be more militant and all. But I now find that the informal sector which has been neglected and which actually forms an overwhelming majority of the labor force has really not, uh, has really not come into the limelight to the extent it should have. Um, you have, at present, if I look at the statistics in India, 93% of the labor force of 470 million are in the informal, are in in informal employment. And just 7%, which in other words would mean 27 or 28 million people out of 470, are in the formal sector. And out of that formal sector also you have one million, over a million, who are working in the plantation sector. And who would be, though they are formal, they have got permanent jobs, but their conditions of employment are such that you, they, they are no better than the, their level of living and all is no better than that of the informal sector. So I have been, but the urban informal sector itself fascinates me because it is over a hundred million in our country. And they're involved in a whole range of activities. Uh, and they have very strong links with not only the national economy, but also the global economy. And, uh, and this is something which we overlook. 38% of our exports are from the small scale sector, which in our country that comes under the informal sector. 64% of the gross domestic product is generated by the informal sector. These are sometimes spoken in seminars or even some senior government officials will talk about them. But nothing much is done after that. What happens to these people? Why are you having cheap labor of this sort? Who does it benefit? Does it really benefit? On one side we can say it's good because at least they've got some employment. But when we look at the ILO concept of decent work, this falls very short of that. Under no stretch of imagination can you talk about a major part of the informal sector, you know, coming under the category of decent work. I thought I'd just... Thank you for giving us a very good overview of the field that you have been working and some relevant statistics in the Indian uh, societal milieu and in the Indian societal sector. Uh, my first uh, precise question is, uh, what are the exact components of this urban informal economy which could provide as a substantial structure of alternative economy to the mainstream economy as such? Now, first of all, the informal economy is a very heterogeneous concept. It, it includes, let's say, if there are two divisions, one is the services and the other part is the manufacturing part. So it includes both. And the manufacturing part, as I told you, in the small-scale industries, we find that, I mean, these are official figures. Uh, some people doubt them, but anyway, about 30 million workers are there in the small scale sector. That means factories having nine workers or less. If they are using power 
or 19 workers or less if they don't use power that is electricity or any other form of power now you have uh, such a large section 30 million and please remember that the entire formal sector is 27 million or 28 million at the most so this that is one part which is engaged in manufacturing manufacturing is also done in several other ways through home based production people who are working let's say in the fashion industry women living in slums under dirtiest conditions not having even proper infrastructure facilities like toilets electricity now if, if i you know the work which we are doing in slums you can see that these home based workers they sit outside their houses or outside because to work because the rooms are too dark inside and they will spoil their eyesight and they are doing minute embroidery work which becomes a part of the fashion industry where and the money which they are paid is just a fraction of what would actually be uh, would be the the cost of the garment i think one of the i mean if i just deviate slightly this issue in bangladesh the house collapse actually shows also exposes is just a tip of the iceberg it shows the average of these people that you know to get cheap everything cheap there is cheap labor cheap housing cheap factories just in order to increase your profit and i was told that walmart which is the main buyer from these places when they had their just two or three days ago they had the annual general conference they didn't even raise this issue somewhere that they were directly or indirectly involved in this tragedy because these are the people who keep saying that you give us at lower rates and then the people there have to comply with it and this is what happened then the informal sector is, is just in india is the same thing is happening there you have all sorts of things i could just give you one example of the import of the of the type of foreign exchange we get in 2008 when the meltdown took place wall street journal had written an article saying how india was not affected and the fact india was not affected as badly as the several of the developed countries were he says because of the informal sector which was like a safety net for them people could get jobs there actually the fact is that our banks were not nationalized and maybe the banking system was a bit more regulated that's why it didn't go down but to say that the informal sector is a safety net which might be okay when you say when a worker loses his job in a factory in a large factory and he works in a small scale industry you can say something is better than nothing so he has some sort of a support there but actually in reality it is not true as far as the international situation is concerned because a large section of the informal sector is actually producing for exports which we don't understand even a small thing waste recyclers or what we call waste pickers see most of their goods which they do which they themselves don't know because they would be the lowest in social ranking and everything in the informal sector they go on from street to street collecting paper collecting various things there is some specialization there some collect bones some collect hair some collect uh, paper now what happens is when the demand for these products go down in the developed countries as a result of the metal down it is this man who suffers or this woman in most cases is the woman i can give you an example 2008 the cost of 1 kilo of human hair you know which was which these people would get was 1000 rupees well let's not convert it into other currencies let's say 1000 units within a few months that fell to 300 see such a crash so how does this person exist instead of working from 5 o'clock in the morning you have to work at 2.30 to 3 increase your time so that you can at least get some sort of an income same thing happens with waste paper with paper factories in the west especially in Germany and others they buy uh, used paper and I believe Korea Seoul is the main center where the paper is stored and cardboard paper and cardboard so there and then is distributed to other places so this paper rag picker who has no idea of anything perhaps outside his own city his income is halved because of something which happened several thousand miles away 
and he is the main sufferer for it. So to say that the informal sector has really been a, uh, this thing is not correct. And and this informal sector, the government, uh, the state, everybody, they should recognize the fact that how sensitive this is, and something has to be done for improving these people and their living conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it was a very good introduction on outlining the basic composition of the urban informal sector in the Indian context and different trajectories one could identify going down to the minutest level as to how uh, him or her as an individual as in his work capacity is affected due to the other due to the economy changing in other parts of the world just one clarificatory question here as to what are the different factors that make up for the need of an informal worker like how do they come into existence is it need based or is it rural urban migration in india what is it exactly thank you thanks i think this is a good question because there are several dimensions to it definitely the rural urban or urban to urban there is you know people moving from small towns to the larger cities in search of better employment come there these people may not be really well qualified or technically qualified to get permanent jobs or better jobs. So instead, they become a part of the informal sector. Uh, and let's say, for instance, street vendors. And this is exactly, you see, what we can say is that entry into the informal sector is much easier. And you don't require much skills for it. Entry into the formal sector may be very difficult because nowadays jobs are not available. To get a job in a, in a large factory would require not only skills but also a social network. There. Whereas here to become a street vendor is not that difficult. That's one part. Then the second part is when they work in these, uh, what's it called, um, uh, labor oriented intensive work in small factories. There again, you see, there, there you don't need much skills for it. Others who are working, let's say, in the construction industry, uh, whereas the construction industry may be well paying in other places, but as far as India is concerned, you find most of the people are not very well educated. In fact, they may not be educated at all, and they are mainly involved in manual labor and in skills such as masonry and all, which they have learned from their parents or from by working as an apprentice to someone else. It's not through any formal sort of a educational set. So you have this type of a thing is there and these again as I said, the construction sector of course, now the building boom is there. But even the small industries, most of them are linked with the large industries. This is what the theory of, of the structuralist theory of uh, manual, uh, this Portis and uh, Castle. Manuel Castle, they had said that the informal sector is very strongly linked with the formal sector. It is not, as ILO believed earlier, a sort of a parallel sector. He says the formal sector is there, therefore the informal sector exists. So the formal sector wants cheap labor to get their components. Like you'll find most of the foreign countries, uh, the car companies, only 20% of the production of components is done in their own factories. In India, that is, you have these three automobile hubs, Pune, Gurgaon and uh, Chennai. Only 20% by the big companies like Daimler and BMW and Ford and whatnot. The remaining comes from the small scale sector. So if that sector is affected, the car production is also affected. But more, more likely the other way it happens that when there is a slump in the economy, the sale of cars decline, it is this fellow who is working in a small factory, drawing a meager amount, working under precarious employment and under a lot of insecurity, he is the one who gets the axe first. Another point, if I can say so. But why this exists is because our legal system permits it to exist in India. We have. Coming to the next yeah. Question. Could I? Yes. That's, I mean, you 
just touched the next question and if I could just explicate it no that's fine in the terms uh, because uh, simultaneously uh, during our conversation we are covering our thematic areas as well we already got a very good picture of the structure of other economies as such so far under the urban informal economy in India and touching the legal aspect what uh, uh, and which also covers our thematic area of transformative constitutionalism. So what have been the limits of national policy on urban street vending formulated by the government of India? And when was it, uh, in which year was it uh, legislated, this national policy? And what are the limits through which there is a scope to change them? So there is always a scope of change in legal legislations for the better. Thank you. Well, if I, yeah, I think this is, a, this is a specific point you've raised on the street vendors. Since, and I would like to answer it because I have been associated with this right from the beginning. In, in 2000, I had organized, I had done a survey of seven cities at the request of a national organization called National Allowance Alliance of Street Vendors of India and the self-employed. Women of India, Association of India, Self-Employed Women's Association, sorry, SEMA. Now, the, they had asked me if I, as a researcher, I was then teaching in the University of Mumbai, that if you could do this, because the facts which we bring out in this would help in advocacy with the government in trying to bring in some sort of protection for street vendors. It so happened that when, I, when we presented this report, in front of the minister and many other organizations were there in Delhi, in Vigyan Bhavan. The minister was immediately was taken aback and he said, okay, I think there is a genuine point. And uh, he didn't know so many people were involved and, and so much of the economy. I said, it's not just a question of street vendors, but it's also the backward linkages. The small scale sector, the, they, they sell cloth, they sell food, they sell vegetables. All these are produced by small growers, by small factories. Now, if you remove street vendors, these people will not be able to market these goods on their own. So, street vendors also help them out. So, then they said, we'll set up a, a task force for, um, you know, for uh, framing a national policy on street vending. I mean, this is exactly what we wanted. The task force was set up. It comprised some officials and people like me. I was taken in as an expert there. And there were some three or four union representatives. And it, it so happened that every time we met, the union people were talking about their own cities and how the police were doing this. But actually, we are not making much headway because the whole purpose was not to discuss which officer evicts uh, people, uh, the street vendors, but mainly to stop it. We need a law or a policy, you know, instead of going after certain individuals. But it's not the individual, but it's the entire system which actually creates such a system. So if you remove the individual, someone else will come and do the same thing. Then finally, we did. They set up a, a small, a smaller committee called the a drafting committee. I, I also happen to be a member of that, and we drafted out the 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 the, the national policy. Now, this was in 2002. We finally did that. We gave it to the ministry. We were quite happy. Everything would go on. Finally, it was accepted by the cabinet in 2004. After two years. Then, by then, the new government came in when Manmohan Singh became, I mean, the present one, the UPA one. Uh, the, the patron now, she's the chief patron of Seva, Ila Bhatt. She had requested, because Manmohan, the Prime Minister had called her for, um, uh, for you know, to discuss with her uh, about this informal sector. So, she just said that, look, we, these people have framed a policy. So, just because it's under the old government, please don't try to throw it out. And he says, yes, we'll do it, but we'll have to do it through our own thing to show that we've made some minor changes and we're passing it. That went on till 2006, the policy was finally passed. But the problem is that when you have a policy of that sort, you it's not mandatory because street vending is a, is a municipal local issue. And the laws of the municipality are framed by the state governments, that is the provincial governments, and not by the central government. I had raised this issue much earlier. I said that such a policy could, could become a guideline. It cannot be mandatory. And that's what happened. And I said the next thing the government was to do, and in fact, even Manmohan Singh, 
the chief prime minister has written a letter to all the state governments saying that please implement the policy met with mixed response then finally the pressure was that there should be a law and they have introduced the law based on the policy and the law will possibly be passed in the next session of parliament now the point is that that you have 10 million street vendors at a very rough guess there might be much more than that in this country now these 10 million people require some protect some protection they are not just uh, it's not a small number and they are operating they are they are delivering legal goods but under conditions of illegality because they are not recognized as being uh, sort of you know that that their work is not recognized so the municipality comes and and evicts them the police can do that because the police under the under the police act and which is there in every state then the police have a right to evict anybody who's uh, in an unauthorized way exposing goods for sale on the pavement as a result it's not just a question of this type of brutality but it's also the fact is that there's also a lot of rent seeking involved and which is my mind boggling and that's what i'm afraid of that this will not i don't know how far the policy will go unless the street vendors themselves raise i mean they have been being more and more vocal unless they say that look there's a law there's a policy you better implement it left to themselves these people won't because if nothing else and i say this openly to them also to the municipalities when i speak that they will lose a lot of their income i mean the amount of money in in delhi there was a hearing then in mumbai also when we had this thing we knew it it goes into millions of rupees the per annum the the bribes which are taken there in fact the amount that money had it been made into taxes for the street vendor he would willingly have paid it because that would also you know relieve him of the headache and the municipality would have made a lot of money out officially but it doesn't happen that way thank you thank you for uh, enlightening us uh, on this uh, limitations of the national policy uh, which uh, has a strong critical angle because many times it looks like a mockery more further than because in when state institutionalism acts against uh, some interests of the community that need further protection in fact which just gets me to my next question so of course apart from street vending and you gave a very good example of national association of street vendors of india as a very effective initiative uh in order to help redress the grievances uh, uh, because it's a large number as you said 10 million or could be further more and many of them they are unaccounted for as well uh w- what are the uh, uh, major other aspects of other like we discussed street vendors and then uh, there are a lot of domestic servants or the domestic help and and what are the legal challenges that are st- that we still need to cover in order to render further social economic protection to these sections of the society thank you uh, yes uh, apart from street vendors you have many others in this section these would mean uh, as I, as you rightly said domestic workers which form a large chunk then waste pickers who also are equally big in number and uh, many others the point is not just of allowing them to function see waste pickers they do perform a positive side in uh, collecting waste material on the street which the municipality should be doing but yet they are victimized and sometimes you know this person this woman she'll pick a lot of paper in a huge bundle she'll keep it aside then some municipal truck will come and take it away saying that you're obstructing the road the pavement so a whole day's income is gone so these sort of things happen to them some form of regulation is necessary but i think more important than that is that the state has to have some form of social protection for these sections the vulnerable sections which it doesn't have because social protection in our country is restricted is given through the employer and it is restricted only to the formal sector why what is the reason every worker should be entitled to social protection but the subtle thing is that the social that a permanent worker 
will be given social protection because all these things whether it is um, medical facilities when you are ill whether it is leave all these are granted by the employer and the employer has been told to do that so those who don't have an employer don't get this protection but the fact is that we are not talking about those who don't have an employer let us say a construction worker or anybody else you know or others i mean who who are working maybe 360 days a year but they have different employers so the the permanent status of a worker is determined on whether they have a permanent employer or not so the workers det- i mean the state is trying to show that the workers worth is determined by the employer and not by the worker him- himself or herself so i think this is the 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 thing so now that's why we say that that, that it has to shift from the state to the uh, i mean from the from the employer to the state that's when you see i can't imagine if you have such a rule for domestic workers we know very well in india what will happen because a domestic worker works in five houses who's going to contribute and whenever you have this type of social protection even in the formal sector there's a two way contribution like if you have the workers insurance which gives them the thing it's called that uh, state insurance uh, corporation employee state insurance corporation now there a part of it the contribution is made by the worker and the employer makes another part of the contribution now in this case which of the five employers are going to make that and each will skirt the thing uh, that you know put the blame on the other and this woman because she wants this protection she'll be only too enthusiastic to pay her contribution but her employers would not pay in the construction field they've got out of it by charging a cess on the buildings if any building is worth more than 1 million the construction cost then 2% of that cost has to be given to the construction board for welfare of construction workers i know in my state of maharashtra they have passed an act for the domestic workers a board for domestic workers for their welfare but i spoke to the labor secretary some time back now she's been transferred and she says you know my own officers are against it that the ias officers so first of all he said i wanted 2% of the you know i said if the the board has no money you constitute a board but it has no money so what you do is so how are they going to pay for for anybody's illness or anything else so what she had suggested was that 2% of the stamp duty you know whenever you transfer property you have to pay a duty on that says so 2% of that should go to the board finance immediately rejected it and some of the senior officers said why are you putting these domestic workers as it is they are they are such a nuisance they don't come on time and things like that of course he forgets that if he doesn't come on time to the office he doesn't lose his his salary for the day but they are very particular about the domestic workers and they said well, you know unnecessarily you know you're 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 raising them on this pedestal and then they won't work after this so that is the attitude so again you require and and i've seen that in cases where they are unionized uh, they can get things done so actually it's also this alternative also means more of grassroots level democracy in this form and not of someone standing up and saying i'm going to do everything for you and you follow me and i'll be your this thing and you use your your multi, the the members as a pressure on the state no it should be the members themselves who should go and do that that's how that will be the learning process for them and we have done it and that's exactly what i'm i would like to i mean in the course of this project if i'm there i'd like to elaborate on that and do studies on that to show how these people have been successful through their common effort because this then becomes emancipating for them the same people who are told over and over again socially politically culturally that they are dirt they don't belong to the society and they always depend on others for getting their work done on the benefit you know the benevolence of others but the same people can raise their heads and say no as a citizen i deserve this then i think that is emancipation Uh, that's a more uh, uh, emancipatory definition of emancipation as you highlighted when grassroots initiative themselves emancipate you out of your own so called imposed recognition given from the other and just one question because that also addresses one of the themes of democratizing democracy which is 
our first theme in Alice is within the sector of urban informal economy uh, is it that the there is a caste dimension or the gender I know many cases women are more affected than men when it comes to construction workers or even domestic helps but according to you yes and according to you do uh, lower castes or women do you think they are at the margins within this framework of urban informal economy yeah the urban informal economy has these type of dimensions and i think you're right but in the case of india caste becomes a very important issue whether we like it or not i may not like this whole existence of caste but we can't overlook we cannot overlook our own uh, you know the the, the reality and unless we accept this reality we cannot change it so it's a fact and this is what I've, I'm, I've been arguing elsewhere that the, that though the informal sector may provide employment to 93% of the labor force but also when there is a rural urban migration as you had rightly said in the beginning that one does expect and what happened during the industrial revolution when people from villages they left their thing they were forced out maybe they come to urban areas work in the factory which is supposed to be an equalizing effect but if you have the informal sector you're actually reinventing the same inequalities again because it's only people of the lower caste will work as waste pickers it's only people who are in the lower caste the untouchable sections who will become conservancy workers you don't find anybody from the upper caste doing that. And even in the case of street vending, you rarely come across. I mean, you won't find, you see, this, this is the whole problem. Street vending is slightly better. So you'll have what we call the backward classes there. They won't be the strictly scheduled caste or the un ex-untouchable caste. They won't be there much. But they will be. Uh, there. So, so, But you'll have the backward. You won't have the upper caste there either. Because there's something they will feel is demeaning. And their social network will ensure that if someone doesn't really do well, that they can get something better than that. They can even be watchmen and security guards and things like that, but would not be standing on the road and selling things, which many people might consider demeaning. So it's also, you know, how we look at things there. That is what is important. Now, I had done a study a long time back on workers in small industries in, in Mumbai. Um, in fact, in the uh, it's a sort of another town, Thane, uh, which has a huge industrial estate. And I found that most of them belong to the other backward classes. That means, you know, they, they're not untouchable, but at the same time, they're not high caste. And the untouchable sections were would be working in other places, you know. So, I mean, who are ex-untouchables. We, we, we say that we want to we want to uh, abolish caste. But if we want to do that, we should also think in terms of the informal sector and how it tries to, you know, perpetuate a system of this sort. And, uh, women, do you have anything to say on the conditions of women? Because it's f it, it forms a major chunk of the population of informal workers in India. You're yeah, absolutely correct. Because whereas in the formal sector, women constitute one-seventh of the formal sector. And that I can tell you is because uh, out of that 1, 1 million or 1.5 million plantation workers, half of them are women. So that increases their, their uh, you know, the, the average. But others would be much less in other industries, in the formal sector. Whereas in the informal sector, one third comprise women. And women, you're right, are the ones who do the worst type of activities. Like, for instance, even in street vending, whereas in Africa, Brazil, Latin America, you'll find women come out in street vending, they're the main street vendors. Whereas in India, you'll find is the males who are the main street vendors. Because given that low income, it is still higher than that of the, of, uh, the women who are pushed down as home-based workers. If you do have women who are uh, street vendors, you'll find that their volume of business is much less because nine chances out of ten she is there because the husband doesn't do any work. So she is there and therefore and, and she doesn't have much capital to invest in this. So she'll be a small uh, vegetable vendor or something of that sort. Same thing but and in other things like rag picking, waste pickers and all, you'll find it's more or less women. In fact, I did see once that in certain areas, when it is more profitable, that is, when you are stationary, 
if a, 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 a street a rag picker uh, gets a contract, let us say, of a swimming pool or a hotel or an office that you can, you can, you know, you I'll take away all the waste paper from there, it'll invariably mails because the income will be much more. But when you are walking all around the city, miles together, carrying a, a plastic bag on your shoulder, picking up, looking around for scraps of paper and things like that, or plastic, whatever is there. It's the women who do this. So one sees a kind of inherent hierarchy therein, even when it comes to women and caste within different kinds of work within the informal working sector in India. And my last question is, which addresses perhaps uh, the issue from a kind of general perspective, as in the utility of this urban informal economy, especially for the large chunk of lower middle class and the poor, which is increasingly becoming a phenomenon in cities like Delhi, Bombay, Mumbai, Bangalore, Hyderabad, and Calcutta, Kolkata, and many other cities. So, of course, this is one of the utilities that one sees prima facie. What is the? What are the other utilities or the significance of such economy in the Indian context? Thank you. Yeah, it is true that most Indian cities, though they may appear very flashy and you know, extra, talking in terms of getting high, like Delhi and Mumbai would be two classic study, uh, cities which are trying to emerge as international cities. But the fact is that grim thing about, at least you know, I know about Mumbai better than Delhi, but the official statistics for 2011 census, it's outdated, it might be, uh, is that 73% of the households live in one room. This includes slum dwellers who will constitute about 60% of the population. 18% live in two rooms and the remaining 9% have more than two rooms. Now if this is your the your structure of your urban cities and we are only worried about the 9% or maybe even less than that, 2% and 3%, which may be a lot if you look at the 1.12 million population, that 2% may be a lot in terms of purchasing power. But the fact is that that who services this, this section, the poorer section? The state doesn't do that. It has, well, a rationing system which gives them, but I know in the case of Mumbai, it is in many cases, uh, the food, the quality is so bad that they don't even lift it. Or if they do, they might sell it to someone who's even poorer than them. Street vendors have told me that. We have our ration cards, we collect our ration, but we sell it off to someone, maybe some people who are even worse than them, and they get something. He says, we can't eat that stuff because it's such poor quality food given there. Now, and that is one. So where do they depend on? Is not the government supposed to or the state supposed to subsidize these people? Because after all, as we have seen so far in this discussion, that they make vital contributions to the city's economy. But they're made to feel that they're outsiders. I think that is the trick in keeping them like that. That they should not demand much to say, whatever you're getting, we're giving you a charity. So let's not emancipate them, keep them that way thinking that they are depending on they are dependent on the benevolence of the state but that i think is a, is a major issue which we have to challenge that uh, otherwise if you just look at it like i've always argued even with the street vendors in all this, is that see you have street vendors they sell cheap food they sell cheap clothes i mean which are durable but uh, i wouldn't say cheap in that sense that their the quality is low but cheap in terms of costs and vegetables and various other things which the poor buy. Today the poor are able to give, say at some festivals, new clothes to their children thanks to street vendors. So you have a classic case of one section of the urban poor, that is a street vendor, actually subsidizing the other section of the urban poor. This is something which the state could have done. but. That's, and I think that is the tragedy, where the poor are left to each other, their own resources. Because the state, in such a case, does not help, forget far from helping, it appears more as a predator. You know, the state will not be there to provide housing, instead it will demolish the slums which these people live in. The state will not give you jobs for other things, but even when people like street vendors try to create their own employment, you will come and destroy them. So that's, I think, the, the tragedy. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm painting a very gloomy picture, but that is not 
that may not be totally correct because on one side I'm giving you the problem but on the other hand we should also see how these people are on their own resources trying to fight back and try I mean after all this uh, the, the, the I have seen this in small towns like Mysore and all where the national policy is being implemented by the municipality thanks to the unionization of state vendors there in fact one municipal officer when I went to Mysore he told me I really thank these people because I never knew that such a policy existed. Can you imagine? It was the people who educated him or maybe emancipated him to tell him that such a policy is there. So he was trying to, you know, he said, I'm using that to. So I think it's not totally bleak, but the situation is bad. But I, I, I we always have confidence in human capacities. And that's, I think that would be the solution. So there have been some examples still in, in few cities in India, which give us a ray of hope in this gloomy picture where poor are left at the mercy of each other and state on the other hand realizes how important they are for the sustenance of the economy of the city and ultimately to the economy of the country but wants to keep them at the margins still and is really reluctant to get them to the mainstream thank you very much we uh, got very enlightened with your views on this specific aspect of urban informal economy addressing many interesting and significant significant themes in our project as well. Thank you very much, Professor Sharid Bhomik. Thank you. I, I hope I, whatever I've said made sense and I'd be very happy if some people benefit by this. Thank you. And thanks to Alice once again for having invited me here and Dhruv for capable, I think, conducting this interview. Thank you very much.